Hey, <laughs> hey, how's it going? Welcome to. <laughs> All right, here we go. Hey, how you doing? Welcome to my 1,111 subscriber special, the long awaited, or I should say the long delayed, but not awaited by anybody subscriber special. All right, we got through the intro. So our last subscriber special was around 748. So since then we've reached 1,300 subscribers. My channel was mentioned by Kenny Joya and really hearing Kenny say IDD QD sound. Probably the best moment of my life. I don't think that's <laughs> too much of an exaggeration. So that was really nice. You know, I think we're doing okay. And so this is a very long video. So you will see the questions that I'm answering on the screen right now. And they're also clearly indicated as chapters. So you can just skip to the relevant chapters that you'd like to watch. But if you watch the whole thing, you know, it's fun. And now let's get to the community questions. So the first question is from Bo Denarius, awesome musician, producer, songwriter. He's been on our Mixing Feedback Monday live stream and he's made a few J JS plugins that I really enjoy using. Bo asks, do you take on mixing slash mastering gigs? And the answer in short is yes. However, I think the pandemic has changed that to a certain extent. So my personal preference, I want to be involved in the recording process. I want to write a few lines. That's kind of the ideal and that's where I have the most experience. This is what I did back in Turkey where a singer songwriter would come to me with a song and usually the song has, you know, lyrics, possibly a melody and a chord progression. And then we start to kind of arrange the songs together add bass, electric instruments, keys, drums, and then go into the studio and record those. And then I would mix those. That's my dream scenario for working on an album. With the pandemic, recording is a little bit iffy. So I do take on mixing gigs. And whenever I mix a project that somebody else has recorded or otherwise produced somehow, I do some basic mastering for free. So I give them a final mix and I give them a free mastering in case they need it. But I always tell them, go to somebody else. And it's not that I am totally incompetent in mastering. Maybe I am a little bit. I just just don't think you should master what you mix, right? But some basic mastering, yes, I do do that. And again, pre-pandemic for mastering, I would rent a studio with hardware gear and I would do it there. With hardware gear, it's just easier for me. I'm not saying in the box is not possible. It's very possible. But again, you know, just my listening environment in the house is not really great for doing proper mastering. So I do mastering for free for anybody who sends me a mixing project. And I send them a mix down as well. And I advise them to actually get it mastered with somebody who's, you know, who's got the equipment and the space to do so. So yes, could have just said yes and moved on. All right, so the next question is from Mastering in the Box. I'm very proud to have this person as my subscriber. Make sure to check this channel out if you want to learn Mastering in the Box. And I've been learning a lot. He's a very lovely guy and he explains things very well. So definitely check out Mastering in the Box. I will put a link to all the channels that I'm mentioning here in the description. So make sure to check those out. And Mastering the Box says, hello buddy, I have a question for you. I love Reaper, but sometimes I can get overwhelmed with all the options and choices available. I want to create a custom mastering workflow. So what advice would you give someone looking to create their own workflow in Reaper? All right, so this is a great question. I guess let's get into Reaper and check it out. Okay, so I went ahead and I opened my mastering template. So I guess that's the first thing you need, a mastering template. And my mastering template is pretty bare bones. I got a master bus, I got a reference track bus, and then I got these tracks. So I like to do mastering on a per track basis. So I have my mastering chain on each of these tracks, and that's for doing operations on a per track basis, but then all of that is fed into my mastering mastering chain and this applies to everything in the album. So some processing is done to all of these to master each one based on their needs and they all feed into this main mastering bus. I don't use mastering effects because I also use reference tracks. So I like to be able to A, B my reference tracks and if I have effects on my mastering bus, well, those are applied to the reference tracks, which is not something you want. And I have this reference track here where all my reference tracks that I download go and I have these two buttons on my top toolbar, the mute guide track mutes it and then this one solos it so I can just click on this and I'm a being between my reference track and whatever track it is that I'm listening to then I have this track on top that doesn't do anything right now but it's where I start doing my mastering import clericals so the second thing you need are a set of hotkeys and some custom actions that help ease your mastering process so if you find there's anything you do every time you open a mastering project let's say you normalize all your tracks rename them and then you put 
put them on new tracks and then you name each track based on the song that's on it and then you create regions from it you can make all of those one custom action so that when you start a mastering project you import your tracks and away you go so i have something like that so i have these six tracks currently on my import bus so i basically just drag these from my media explorer or just from my finder into my first track and now i run a couple of clericals so first one is mastering album clericals and i select it and i hit it and this happens so each song is now put on its own track and then regions are created from them and the regions are named after the tracks which helps me later when i render because when i render i just use the region as a wild card and i'm off to the races you can also save your render settings here so if you have a normal mastering render settings you know with a sample rate and a resample mode and a bunch of things save that as a preset and then you can recall it whenever you want so once i did that i'm gonna select all these tracks and i am dragging them down to this project i can now go ahead and delete all of these from my template i preserve this one just in case i need to bring in another batch of tracks or something like that now i select these tracks i run my second album clericals which now names the tracks after the items that's on them and it colors them randomly just to give me some differentiation so that's another thing you can do whatever clerical tasks you do whatever it is that you do every time you start a mastering project you can probably make a custom action or two from that now i'm ready to do my mastering next thing i'm going to import my mastering key map and that's another really useful feature you can create and export and import a series of key maps so normally what i do with reaper is audio video editing songwriting things like that so i have one set of hotkeys for that and then for mastering a lot of those actions are not really useful for me like uh, i'm not doing a lot of trimming i'm not doing a lot of time stretching i'm not doing a lot of phase aligning or dynamic splits stuff like that i'm doing some other operations so i can go ahead and import my mastering key map and once you import your key map it instantly changes a lot of your hotkeys and you make these as you go so do one mastering project and do a bunch of things see what operations you did a lot set a one key hotkey to all of those so for example in my mastering key map i can use a to bypass and unbypass a track's effects and that is useful for a being things right so i can really quickly a b my track effects and then a b my mastering effects with that with this track selected if i press one i get its first effects two second three four five and six it's annoying that they are they cascade this way but i can kind of space these out i can move them around let's do something like this and let's say i'm comfortable with this workflow and now i can go ahead and press the same numbers one to five and then whenever i come back to this they are right back how i left them so i can kind of drag my fingers along one to five splap and they're all here and now they're gone with the same keys things like that so some of my hotkeys change based on my mastering workflow i also have a mastering screen set so if i I hit f12 i get all my monitoring effects here and i can move them up and down so that's the next thing screen sets make a screen set that you're comfortable working in that you see everything you need to see make your mastering meter really big if you don't put anything on it and now you can hit Control and e and save this as a screen set and then call it i don't know mastering action maybe you want a screen set where your monitoring effects are not docked but they're full screen other than that i mean this is my custom workflow so you should check out what you do a lot i didn't really sit down and create a mastering template and a whole set of mastering shortcuts just as a session of work i did a mastering project and then when i did do that mastering project i learned a lot of things from it and then i went back i created a template out of that and i tried to pay attention to what things wasted my time a lot so renaming things and normalizing wasted my time a lot so i tried to optimize those by creating custom actions i saw what things i use a lot well i use a lot of plugins on tracks so why not go ahead and make hotkeys for those so you have your custom actions, you have your dedicated key map, you have your screen sets. Maybe you can make some toolbars, again, doing actions that you do a lot. So create a mastering toolbar and place that somewhere where you like. And with your template, your effects chain for your mastering, your go-to effects chain, your hotkeys, your custom actions, and your dedicated key map, you are off to the races. Because yeah, I understand what you're saying. Like you can be really easily overwhelmed about how much is possible to do in Reaper. So instead, start the other way around think of what you want to do if you were in a magic world where you can think anything and your doll would understand it and do it what sorts of things you want to do once you know what those things are then you can try to make custom actions cycle actions things like that and work from there so i hope that at least gave you a little bit of info to kind of start on your quest to creating your custom workflow and if you have any questions on that obviously let me know and i'd be happy to try and help you
Okay, next question is by Andreas. And Andreas is one of the kind of top commenters of the channel and he's donated to me. So Andreas, thank you so much for being so involved in the channel. Really everybody who asked the question are some of the people that, you know, props to all of you. Andreas says, I wonder if I can replicate a Pro Tools habit of mine when tracking acoustic guitars or choirs. Uh, I used to track acoustics with two mics on two mono channels. After recording, I drag these two mono channels on a stereo track, which is great for further treatment, plugins just on one track, panning, etc. And, and then repeat, recording on the same two mono tracks and dragging on stereo tracks underneath. Very fast and easy. How can I replicate that in Reaper, which has only one track type? I'm struggling with imploding and exploding tracks in Reaper. Any tips? Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All the best. Hope you are well. So this is the first topic I ever covered, actually. Mono to stereo and stereo to mono Pro Tools style. Those are my first two Reaper tutorials. So you can always check those out, though they haven't aged well. But I'll tell you a few ideas and there's a few ways you can approach this. So the first way is that you you can just record in stereo. So just for the sake of argument, let's say I'm recording guitars, I'm recording a DI from track two, and I'm miking the amp with my SM7B, just for the sake of argument. So what I can do is I can record them stereo. So I'm recording them stereo, they're all on one track, nothing to it. And I have one mic on one track, one mic on another track. Well, I can drag this to another stereo track. And when I say stereo track, it's better not to think of it as a stereo track. I'll drag it to a two channel track. Now I have a two channel item. Now what I can do is I can set the pan mode to do dual pan and hit OK. And now I have dual pans for this track. So essentially I can have both of them centers and it'll be like two mono tracks superimposed on top of each other. You know, I can pan them like this. So maybe my DI is a little bit left and then this is hard left. Again, you, you can pan them totally independently of each other. And then if you want to process them separately, you can again create two tracks and you can send track one to one of these, set track two to the other one, put your plugins here. So, you know, let's call this DI, let's call this amp. You know, I can go ahead and disable the master parent send. I can pan these center cause whatever this pan now tells us where they go. Cause one channel goes to one, the other channel goes to the other. And then I'll put my plugins here. So I'm always editing just this one item. Same thing if I, you know, put stretch markers or something, it affects both tracks. So all of the timeline things I'm doing, I'm doing on one track that contains both. And I'm routing the audio out to two separate channels and then I'm I'm processing the audio from here. I can send to, you know, further reverbs and delays from here. I can pan them whichever way I like from here. So that's one way of doing it, which I think is really useful is to not record two mono tracks, is to record into two channels. So I guess the only limitation there is that they need to be adjacent to each other. And there is this option called show non-standard stereo channel, i.e. input two, input three. So you have to have that on so you can do like two and three or four and five. Otherwise you can do one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. I don't know of a way of doing like two and five, but that's something you can do on your interface side. So if you're recording a DI and you're recording a mic, just have them on two adjacent inputs, record them as a quote unquote stereo, but really it's just a two channel track. Do all your editing from one track, send them out and do the processing from other tracks while toggling off the master send on the track that just houses the item. So that's the best way of doing what you want to do, I think. That said, I do have these custom actions. So for stereo to mono, I can just explode the track and now I have the two channels on two separate mono files. And then for mono to stereo, I have this custom action where I select these two tracks, hit it, and they go on the top track. And I explained that in more detail in the first video. So that's how to quickly do that in a few different ways. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, so the next question is by Vit Zizka. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Hello, I have a question. I like to record guitar on two tracks, e.g. DI and mic. When I group the two tracks, items on these tracks are not grouped and I have to group them afterwards in order to edit them easily. Is there a convenient way to record on two tracks and have their items instantly grouped? So I think the answer to Andrea's question is part of the answer I would give you as well. Just record record them as stereo and then route them out to separate tracks. So you're editing on one track and you're actually getting their sounds out of another track. So I think that would work for you. But a quick note on track grouping and let's jump into Reaper for that. So in Reaper, you have grouping tracks and you have grouping items and they're not mutually exclusive. So if you group two tracks and for example, let's group these two tracks, I can go to grouping parameters and I can group any or all of these parameters. And then you can also have a lead follow situation, which I'll do a full tutorial on later on. But for now, just let's check it out the basic form. 
So if I adjust the volume or pan, that applies to both of these tracks. So that is track grouping. It only works on the track parameters that are indicated. Then you have grouping items. Go to group items. And now these two items are grouped together, meaning if I trim it or split it, they will be split together. However, something that you will see happen very quickly is that if I start coming back, let's say I come back to this and I split this one more time. Sometimes what you see happen is that groupings are not uncoupled correctly. So I start moving this one and suddenly another track moves with it. And of course, as I'm doing this for a demonstration, this doesn't happen. But when I group items and edit them, I sometimes run into some annoying behavior, which is why I think for your application of doing DI and mic, what you can do is just record on a two track channel and then, you know, disable the master parent send on this track, send it to two other tracks so you can process the audio coming from them completely separately. But you're editing them essentially as one item. It's much less headache in the long run, if you ask me. But yes, uh, a lot of people would say the proper way is to group the items and work on it like that. And, you know, if you need to align them, if I need to, for example, let's say move this into place to align it with the top track, I do that first. And then I just go ahead and run my custom action. And now they're one two channel item on this track. Disable master parent send and send them to both tracks. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, so the next question is from Bayan the one who himself makes some Reaper tutorials and is an overall wizard. I'm pretty sure he's more knowledgeable in many areas of Reaper than I am, which goes to show that you don't need to learn from the masters, man. You need to learn from people who like to show you things. Because people are always like, why should I listen to you? Have you ever won a Grammy? I'm like, you don't need to learn from a Grammy winner. You can learn from whoever you want. And even you can learn from idiots by not doing what the idiots do. So that's something to keep in mind. So, all right, Bayan the one says, since you've invited, I'll seize the opportunity, meaning that I invited people to ask whatever they want. Uh, I know you're Iranian, but for a person having an accent, you sound fluent in English. Is this just a case of practice makes perfect or were you exposed to it before moving to the West, like at home, for example? And yeah, so, so first of all, thank you. I'm glad that I sound fluent. Yeah, I was definitely exposed to it as a child just by watching movies and TV shows. Uh, my dad was a big film buff and he would let me watch whatever I want. So when I was, I don't know, 10, I watched The Shining. When I was 11, I watched Goodfellas. He didn't really mind if I watched kind of adult content and they were all in English and I would put on English subtitles when I needed them. I remember I watched Goodfellas once a day for like three months at one point. So those definitely helped. You know, my parents and my aunt, they all speak English. So when I was a kid, when they wanted us not to understand, they would speak English to each other. So that was something that motivated me like, yeah, I want to fucking learn that. And then my catfishing days was a big help as well because during the MySpace days, and this is like maybe early 2000s, I would make a lot of fake kind of cute girl profiles and I would go and catfish American dudes and practice my English by speaking to them. And the reason was that I would, you know, as myself, I would message girls and boys and they wouldn't reply. And then, you know, I became a cute girl and suddenly all these boys are messaging me, all the more practice for me. <laughs> so that's something that definitely helped as well. And at this point, I've been living abroad for about 11 years. I mean, eight years of that was in Turkey, which is not an English speaking country. But even there, I was teaching English and, you know, all my colleagues were Americans and Brits. So yeah, I, I picked up a few things in English along the way. Thank you for the question. And I hope that kind of clears it up. I should tell the story of my catfishing days in more detail at some point. All right. So the next question comes from Mike from Let's Talk About Reaper, who also makes really good, really fast, short YouTube tutorials on Reaper. So definitely check him out. We kind of started at the same time. So it's really nice to kind of have somebody to share this journey with. You know, I personally try to kind of stay out of Mike's way. So if I see something that he covers, I'd rather just link to that video. So he has videos on installing SWS, which is something I never covered because I just refer you to Mike for that. So definitely check out his channel. And now let's get to his question. Mike asks, I'm not necessarily a fan of strict LCR panning and prefer to space elements, at least in rock and punk music, as if it were a band on stage. That said, some folks are able to get LCR to work quite well and tend to use it exclusively. What are your thoughts on LCR panning? Sorry, just in case some of you don't know, LCR panning is the process of not using intermediary pan positions. Basically, LCR panning goes, you either have a center, you have a left or a right. Any element you have in your song, either it's hard left, hard right, or it's dead center. And this comes from back in a day where you didn't really have a pan knob or a pan pot on a mixer. You had a three-way switch and you hit it left, it would just go to the left speaker. You hit it right, it would just go to the right speaker or you keep it center and it would go to both at equal volume. 
So that's where the philosophy comes from. And definitely doing LCR panning, especially for beginners, is a good thing to start with. However, I think the keyword here is strict. Am I a fan of strict LCR panning? And the answer is no, I'm not a fan of strict anything. Whether I'm wearing headphones or I'm using speakers, if I take any element and I start panning it from left to right really slowly, I can hear those intermediary positions. So I may not be able to hear the difference between something being 90% panned left and 85% panned left. I'll admit to that. I don't hear that 5% incremental difference in terms of how it feels in the space. However, I definitely hear a difference between something panned 50% left versus hard left. So if I hear those, then I'm going to use that kind of slack in space. And if anything, I'm more strict with frequency based panning. So I would not really pan things hard left and hard right if they got a lot of low end. So in a lot of orchestral music, for example, on the string section, the basses are on one side, the violas and second violins are closer to the middle, and then the first violins are on the right. And this is, you know, stage reverse. So stage right, stage left is what I was talking about. So when you're listening to like a string section, usually you have more low end on one side of your ear. Yeah, so if anything, I'm more strict with what type of frequency content I pan which way. High frequencies, go nuts, pan them wherever you want, split them and pan them all around the place. And with low end, I'd like to be closer to the center. And something that I know from experience, recording my early bands where we just didn't know what we were doing, we were just a bunch of kids who were all playing at the same time, is that arrangement comes into play a lot. If you arrange your tracks well, you make the mixing of them easier. If, you know, band members try to kind of create an interplay, create a dialogue where sometimes the bass takes the back seat and the drums and vocals are up front. And sometimes the vocals stop singing and the guitar plays a solo. And sometimes you let drum and bass go absolutely nuts. Then those kind of decisions in arranging will make it easier to also mix the project. So minimalism goes a long way as well. If I just have keys, guitars, bass, and drums, they're all kind of like giving each other space, then perfect. I can straight up put the bass in the center, pan the drums, and then I would put the guitar on one side, put its reverb on the other side, put keys on one side, put its reverb on the other side. That's the ideal. Don't follow anything strict. Something I say is never listen to any piece of audio advice that starts with always or never, including this piece of advice, because it started with never. Like nothing is always true. Because if anything was always true, by now some programmer would have made a robot to do what is always true. If anything was always correct, human engineers would go out of style really quickly because you could program an AI to do what is always correct. But there are no such things. So that's why human engineers are not obsolete yet. Now that said, there will be machine learning robot engineers that would definitely surpass most of us. They can analyze every recorded piece of music and then make decisions from there. But as it stands, if anything was strictly true all the time, then that would make us human engineers obsolete. So perhaps this is a self-preserving philosophy because I don't want to think of myself as an obsolete engineer. I don't want to think that everything I studied for will be obsolete in a couple of years. But as it stands, I do truly believe that nothing is strict. You got to always make decisions on the spot. And I think, you know, you learn a lot from the film world as well. So in the film world, you have the 5-1 configuration. And yeah, it's very rare that we use those intermediary pan positions unless we are moving something from left to right. So if we're doing a car buy, we may automate it from left to center to right. But most of the time, things are just sent to that speaker. So I have BG tracks sent to the surrounds, BG tracks sent to left and right, BG tracks sent to the center. And you're not really kind of putting things in the midway, but it's clear to see why that is in film because you have six speakers. Nowadays, you have 11 speakers uh, with Atmos and you're, you know, you're just going to get more and more and more speakers. So you're already creating a real sense of space and directionality. Uh, things behind you are actually coming from behind you. Things above you are actually coming from above you. So with film, maybe there's less of a need to do intermediary pan positions. But as it stands with stereo, yeah, I use intermediary pan positions because I can hear the difference in those positions. Again, maybe not in increments of 1%, but definitely I hear them. And yeah, nothing is strict. Every project is different. There are some things that make sense from a physics of sound perspective. For example, the low end center rule. That's got to do more with science than a creative decision that somebody made years ago and everybody's following that. But other things never sent to reverbs at unity gain. No, I do that all the time if I need a lot of reverb on an element. And you know, I'm not saying I do it all the time, but I'm saying I am open to the possibility that maybe sending to a reverb at unity gain is okay. Just be open to the possibility. So that is my personal philosophy. Thank you for the awesome question. Got me going for like 12 minutes. This, this is going to be a lot of editing. <laughs> and finally, I got this question from EJV and it says, I hope I'm not too late to ask a question, but I couldn't find the community post. Yeah, community posts are weird. Some people see them and some people don't. I might 
myself see them in mobile, but I don't ever see them in my browsers. Anyway, the question is, what are some of your other passions other than audio music? Oh boy. I think I have a weird sickness where whenever I develop any kind of hobby, it starts to become an obsession. And from an obsession, it starts to become like a potential career path for me. So a few years ago, I started playing poker and it quickly became my job and consumed my entire life. And I gave that up despite the fact that I was making some money. It was just not my lifestyle and it wasn't something that I studied for. My passion still is audio. I also do some stand-up comedy. I really obviously like making music for films. I really like making jingles for brands. So yeah, I would say my non-audio passions are film, stand-up comedy, cooking, poker, and chess. So thank you for that question. Just in the nick of time, I got it while procrastinating in the middle of shooting this. And I think that's about it. This video is going to be really long. I hope people watch it. But yes, thanks for being with me, all 1,359 of you. Really appreciate all the support that I get. Some people are hating it, but hey, you can't please all the people all the time. If you are subscribed, you can really help if you donate to me or if you just share my channel with your friends. I see some of you in the forums share my videos as an answer to community questions, which is fantastic. Thank you so much for doing that. And if you have any suggestions for the channel, please let me know. A big apology to all the people who watch my sound design for visual media videos because I haven't been doing a lot of those videos in a while. And the reason for that is that I need films that I can put on YouTube and not get a copyright strike. And that's really hard to find. So I'm in talks with some of the people I worked with previously for them to possibly let me use some of their material. But because of COVID, they haven't really gotten to screen their films at any festivals. And some festivals require it as a rule for you not to upload your film on YouTube before they screen it. So I understand why they don't want me to use it yet. And COVID has slowed that down. So sorry that I haven't been making a lot of those. As soon as I have content worthy of making, I will definitely make content. Otherwise, I'm starting a new series called Sound Recipes. And that's where I would just talk about some sound design and some effects chains that I'll try to make only using free and stock Reaper plugins so that you can do some weird stuff that I do. So yeah, let me know in the comments if any of those sound good or if you want me to start a new series or if you want me to stop making any new series or if you want me to stop making content altogether. I won't listen to you, but I would appreciate the comments. That's it for today. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.